morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, and I'm here to usher you into the weekend here in Missoula for the date of November 13th. I'm filming this on November 12th, and so there's... Uh, there's that. So um, most of the information is kind of ongoing and new. I uh, just uh, recently, uh, this morning, also recorded a press conference from the Missoula City Police Department in response to a shooting death of Cale Brown uh, over the weekend, over last weekend, which uh, sparked protests of the downtown uh, city, Missoula City Police Department. Uh, as through um, more investigation and the ask for people to be a little more patient, they held a press conference on Thursday, which answered a lot of questions about the incident. Uh, I'll have more, uh, I have a video I'll show you guys after my initial news report, but let's kick things off with a, a big uh, positive news, is that it uh, looks like a vaccine is looking very promising with a 90% effective rate. Um, of course, there are they are in the initial trial phases, you know, half placebo, half not placebo. Um, big thing is that uh, they're looking for the FDA approval by the end of this month uh, for their uh, final trials uh, for mass distribution and stuff like that. According to PBS Frontline, they spoke with represent from Pfizer, the pharmaceutical company, who said that trials have shown a 90% effectiveness to combat the coronavirus. And Dr. Bill Gruber says, we're in a position to potentially to be able to offer some hope uh, we're very encouraged, he said. What they described how the vaccine works is it targets the spike protein in the coronavirus, in the coronavirus that infects the cells. And uh, later this month, they, if the FDA approves, they'll have emergency use for potentially frontline workers, those who are high risk, uh, pre, uh, pre, uh, uh, conditions, um, sensitive groups, uh, seniors age, uh, uh, older as well, but with the, the the basically the rush to do this, there's about ten other companies around the globe that are through trials and are getting really close to possible vaccines. So everything's looking very promising. There's still that idea that we have to make sure these vaccines are safe, and FDA has to approve these vaccines for mass distribution, and then we'll see how it goes from there. Um, so what they what the requirements is for the FDA is that uh, most vaccines must have a two month uh, uh, grace period to see if there's any side effects to the group and which Fiverr, Fiverr says that they will be at the end of this month. Uh, but regardless of the CEO, of course, the big news is that one of the CEOs for Pfizer uh, was caught potentially with insider trading. But this wouldn't be the first time a CEO has profited off of sick people. Speaking of sick people. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Missoula's food, uh, Billings, Billings Food Bank was broken into. They, uh, stuff was stolen and there was um, vandalism. Uh, winter 2017 saw a huge uh, snow event happening in the, the city of Billings, which uh, collapsed partial roof of the of Billings Food Bank. So far, the building was looted and copper wire was stripped. Uh, the damage, according to Executive Director Cheryl Shandy of uh, the Billings Food Bank, totaled half a million dollars in damages. Another big story happened in Missoula over the last weekend, and this involved the shooting death of Cale Brown by officers. The officers are currently on an administrator leave. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief White um, uh, held a press conference uh, Thursday morning, which was this morning when I was taping. And uh, before I let you go... I'm going to show you guys uh, what he said, and when I come back, I'm going to go on to my next segment. So stay with me. Good morning. I am Chief Jason White with the Missoula Police Department. I'm here today to provide information about the officer-involved shooting that occurred on November 7th. Let me start off by saying this is a tragic event for everyone who was involved, and I offer my condolences to the Brown family. At approximately 5.22, a 911 call was made regarding an in-progress partner family member assault at a residence on the 2300 block of Sherman Lane, Sherwood Lane. The information being provided by the caller indicated the individual was armed with a knife and was actively involved in assaulting the victims. Officers were dispatched to the call at approximately 5.23 p.m. and the first officer arrived on scene at approximately 5.27 p.m. Due to the exigency of preventing further assault on the victims, the initial responding officer approached the front door of the residence. The officer knocked on the door and announced police. When the front door was opened, 
The officer was immediately confronted by Mr. Brown, who was armed with a knife. The officer ordered him to drop the knife, which he refused to do. At the same time, the victims were still inside and the officer took efforts to get the victims out of the residence. In doing so, the officer used himself as a barrier between the victims and Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown threw a chair at the officer as the victims were leaving the residence. The officer continued to give commands for Mr. Brown to drop the knife. He failed to obey those commands and began advancing at the officer in an assaultive manner with the knife. The officer discharged his taser in an effort to stop the assault on him. The taser was ineffective and Mr. Brown continued his assault on the officer. Fearing for his own life and safety, the officer fired four rounds from his department issued weapon. The involved officer and a backup officer who had just arrived on scene immediately began life-saving efforts and called for emergency medical assistance. Despite these efforts, Mr. Brown succumbed to his injuries and died at the scene. The investigation of this incident is being handled by the Montana Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation. This was done in accordance with department protocol and by my request to ensure an impartial investigation. We are fully participating in the ongoing investigation with DCI to make sure they have access to all of the information they need to conduct a thorough and independent investigation. Once DCI has completed its investigation, it will go directly to the Missoula County Attorney's Office. In accordance with Montana state law, the Missoula County Attorney's Office will conduct a coroner's inquest. In addition to these two investigations, the Missoula Police Department will conduct an administrative investigation using the information from DCI to determine the officer's compliance with departmental policies and procedures. The officer involved in this incident has five and a half years of law enforcement experience. The officer has never been the recipient of any disciplinary actions or citizens complaints. In his time with the Missoula Police Department, the officer has received compliments from the public for his professionalism and has earned a life-saving award. Hey guys, welcome back. Um, it's time for a little thing I like to call pre-critic. It's a segment where I prejudge a movie based on uh, no information but the title, the trailer, maybe a synopsis or anything like that. Up now is a show or movie called Freaky. Uh, the big gimmicky thing about this is that it's a body swap uh, serial killer uh, horror film. And it's played for laughs uh, by the director who directed Happy Death Day and then the sequel Happy Death Day to you. Uh, so anyways, it's basically the hot chick, but instead of Rob Schneider's uh, kooky antics, it's more about a psychopath serial killer with the power of a, um, a dagger amulet thing. And then they switch bodies and there's hilarity, but then it gets kind of crazy with all the uh, interesting deaths that they have in there. If you haven't seen the trailer, they freeze a the girl. Uh, they have a... Uh, <laughs> A table saw cut a guy in half. There's just a lot of uh, just a lot of gory stuff they do. This it's played for laughs because Blumhouse. Blumhouse is one of those things where they let's do a lot of horror films, and then later on they they started to realize it's like okay, so if we don't actually take it as seriously as we've done in the past, I'm seeing that a lot of people respond to this. So let's dive into that. Hence we get another movie kind of like that in Freaky. Jingle Jangle. Oh, yes. The first wave of Christmas movies are here. It's a Christmas journey because they thought people would be do, uh, um, they call it Jingle Jangle, a Christmas journey because people would be uh, too dumb to realize it's a Christmas movie, so they had to add Christmas in the title. Forrest Whitaker is in this film. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming he's probably a guy who gives advice in a very, very kind of a quiet intensity in a lot of his roles and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, this young girl, be, uh, um, there's a young girl in this movie who's kind of like the protagonist, because uh, if, it, if they didn't have a young, uh, wide-eyed protagonist in the movie, it would be a, a romantic Hallmark movie that'll happen the holidays. <laughs> Look out for that. Uh, there's a lot of Santa Baby vibes in this movie, because in the synopsis it turns out that it's a very uh, a Christmas nepotism in regards to it, like, oh, oh Santa's retiring. Oh, uh, you you need to take up the mantle of your grandfather, and then that's kind of what you can expect from this movie. Yeah, so nothing special. Up next, we got a another uh, 
game that's coming out. Uh, this oh, I'm talking about a little bit of a video of a game called Spider-Man Miles Morales, which honestly is just a rehash of the original Spider-Man movie. They added probably a couple new plot and new uh, action set pieces within the game. It's a video game, and, and I think the biggest gimmicky thing is that they have a spider cat, and it helps you fight with you. But I'm not sure, because it's getting released this week, uh, probably already out right now, so that's what it all, it's all about. So I'm pretty sure if, if anything that has to do with Miles Morales automatically has something to do with the fact that Peter Parker has to die in this, in this game. So at some point, probably at the end, kind of like what they did with the first game where they, had a, where they killed off a major character. But in the Miles Morales universe, it always... Ten, uh, <coughs> uh, Peter Parker always has to die in the Miles Morales universe, unless it has to do with the Spider-Verse, and then you have another Spider-Man who, from the main universe who's that actually dead. There you go. There's your Spider-Man uh, background and history. And those are your uh, things that are coming out this week. Skip or don't skip. You decide. All right, so I have another one called another movie that I'm premiering for you guys where I take a movie, and I redub over it, and this one is called um, The Young Savages from 1961. Let's take a look. Well, according to this graph, you have a very obnoxious personality. I've been doing the research for a long time now. Why, you ask? Well, it's out of spite. Listen, I got it. Yeah, no, no. I'm not going to talk to you while you're like this. Bye. Hello, I'm your Kirk Douglas impersonator. Whoa. You're striking. I think we just found our man. Well, thank you very much. I got my brothers to punch me in the face. Well, your bone structure's held up pretty well. Well, so do I got the job? Well, <laughs> well, well, let's try your impersonation of Kirk Douglas after all. Uh, so tell me, uh, are you Spartacus? Or are you not Spartacus? <laughs> Come on, it's a simple question. I am Spartacus. I always thought that name was very adorable because it starts with a spart and ends in a kiss. But I digress. <laughs> well, you sound pretty good to me. As long as you look the part, you know, it doesn't really matter what you say, after all. Would I be expected to talk? Well, uh, yes, of course. What would I say, then? Well, you would say your most famous lines, uh, not counting the ones that were written by the Hollywood Eight, you know, those communists. Hmm, well, aren't those the best lines? Um, well, listen, I have to be a little more forthcoming when it comes to this position and this job. So we're not necessarily looking in for a personator per se. We're looking for more of a replacement. Do you actually think I can replace him? Well, of course. <laughs> Maybe. Well, I like to think of myself as a method actor. I like to go deep into the rules. <laughs> Don't you know that method actors are just impersonators? It's just a fancy word of saying it. I'm an actor. If you say so, listen. I'm not looking for perfection. Well, I'm above this. Okay, there's the door. Whoa, whoa, wait. Hold on a minute. <laughs> you passed the test. Congratulations, Kirk. I need to reveal some truths to you. And I'm a method actor, too. Oh, you old so-and-so. I know you're one of us. <laughs> and thus, I started my career as a method actor. Whoa, -ho. Well, hello there, young man. I got a couple questions. Well, why didn't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Smoking's bad. Eh. Hmm. Sorry about the bad first impression. I told the other scouts I don't want to be a James Dean look-alike. It's just awful. Well, the country's in mourning. We just lost James Dean, and we need a replacement. And so you decided to go to prison to find me. Well, you found us, kid. Do you happen to realize how much you look like James Dean? I can tell by your look that you're shocked. I'm not shocked. You think you're the first person to come to me? No. As soon as your mugshot hit the papers, huh, everyone started hitting the pavement to get to you. I think acting's for losers who have no life. That may be true. Well, what's that supposed to mean? What do you mean by that? I know what it's like to be a loser. I was a loser my whole life. No, not as big a loser as me. I'm leaving. I don't need this crap. I am a, not an actor. And I never will be. I'm a very complex person who has lots of passionates. And I don't need you. Officer. I don't need anybody. 
I can do my own thing. I'm going to be a used car salesman. I'm going to do all sorts of normal purple things. All right, come I'm with gonna me. I'm going to do aluminum sheeting on housing. You're not going to tell me what to do. Right, come on. You're going to get out of here. Come on. And I never want to see your face around here again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get out. Did he say passionates? <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back. Over the weekend, there was a shooting that involved the uh, the use of lethal force by the city police department. Uh, there were protests that sparked, and here is a public comment by Josh Decker, uh, who uh, who reflects on the recent use of force by the police department. It saddens me to know that this happened. I know that anytime lethal force is used, it's a unique and complicated uh, circumstance. Um, but it comes on the heels of a delay in our, the implementation of our crisis intervention team. Um, I think that everyone can recognize that had we had a functional crisis intervention team in place, that Kale Brown's death could have been avoided. Mr. Decker went on to criticize where funding the police is going and how the city should focus their uh, focus on their priorities. Uh, in this news story from the Missoulian, it reported that the subject Brown attacked an officer, and it appeared that he uh, tasers had no effect, and he had a weapon, and he and and the intended use was for lethal effect. Uh, the Department of Justice is looking into this further, and Mayor John Ingen has shown support for the. Uh, Missoula Police. Uh, the comments that took place happened earlier this week before the release of the full story and honestly it's still an ongoing investigation and they ask for people to have a little more patience with it. Annie Halsell, who has spoken against the Missoula City Police in the past, uh, has followed up on this as well. We have no reason as a community, as the Missoula public, to trust the Missoula Police Department, to trust the city council or the mayor or the chief of police or the county attorney to be transparent in these matters. For example, months ago, I heard on a council meeting just like this one, that the incident involving Officer Malone was quote, under investigation. Today, November 9th, 2020, Officer Malone is employed by the Missoula Police Department. He was in uniform in the station yesterday, yet body camera footage of his partners shows him bragging about assaulting an ind indigenous man during an incident. He later lied on the witness stand. So whatever is under investigation has not been disclosed to the public. We do not understand or know what disciplinary measures have been taken to address this problem. And therefore we have absolutely no reason to trust that transparency will be exercised with regard to Kale Brown's murder. So those are some of the public comments that were uh, happening earlier on during the city council meeting. Here's John Angen. He uh, came back um, later in the meeting during his uh, um, comments from the mayor, because they usually say that for the very end, and he responded to a lot of these public comments as well, and this is what he had to say. But based on what I know, um, I am very comfortable with this investigation proceeding. Um, I believe, um, tragically, the community is safer today than it was um, uh, before this incident. Um, and uh, the nature of this call would never have gotten a response from our mobile crisis unit. Um, all of that information will be forthcoming. Um, it will be forthcoming in due time. Um, and I would just ask people not to randomly speculate or make inferences without having any information um, or, or even the limited information that we've provided. Um, it's, it's just not time for that and it doesn't help anyone. Um, All right, so let's move on to our next topic, getting more into the nitty gritty of what's happening within the city of Missoula. And part of that is that they are buying the means of, of, of production when it comes to uh, collecting those poplar trees that are uh, in the uh, near the wastewater treatment plant. So here's a little bit more background. Basically, the city uh, leased out a property in a farm, and they started to do a tree farm. And part of this was uh, 
the main point of this was to help uh, recycle some of the water from the river runoff, uh, a more natural waste water treatment facility as well, um, just to kind of help uh, the aquifer in the Missoula County. So they plant all these trees, and uh, this is going to be like an 18-year deal. So we're pretty much like halfway through it, and part of this is what they want to do is they want to be able to collect the trees. And so the city decided to uh, farm the trees. Uh, Heather Harp talks about why the city wants to buy this company to harvest the trees. Right. There is not much demand at all for poplar in, in terms of in lumber form, but the real additional benefit of what this project actually does, it prevents affluent being um, circulated into the Clark Fork River. And I think every single one of us here believes in uh, clean water and that we should do the, the right thing as stewards of both our land and our water and our air. And for that reason, I support this. The total price tag for this is $165,928, and the money comes from, from the Wastewater Enterprise Fund. Um, I went out to the tree farm with uh, the director, Star Sullivan, at the time, a couple years back, and he said that the trees work as their own water treatment plant in their own regard. In many ways, it is to grow and then harvest the wood in 18 years. Um, so far, the city has been renting out this land for about eight. There are currently 90,000 poplar trees um, in that area, just off of the Clark Fork River, next to the wastewater treatment plant. So if you get a chance to drive by there, you're going to see a lot of tall poplar trees over there. Um, so anyways, the city approved uh, a night with 93 with uh, Jesse Ramos, John Contos, and uh, Sandra Vesecki dissenting from the vote as well. There was a couple comments on it regarding the fact that why the city should uh, purchase a coal company in harvesting the trees. So um, moving on... Um, Jeremy Keene, um, he talks about the Mullen area, and Jeremy Keene has been pretty much spearheading a lot of the development of the area in, in, in terms of um, filing um, with, his, with the group, with the city on the build grant, and so this is what he had to say about the Mullen area in terms of, of the overall plan. As, you're, as you are all aware, um, the city in partnership with Missoula County received a federal build grant um, and intends to construct transportation improvements and utility improvements um, in the Mullen Road area. And um, the Flynn Family Partnership intends to develop their property uh, through a third party sale and uh, subject to regulations with the city, um, which require public infrastructure improvements. So construction of the Mullen Build Project benefits their property by reducing their cost of development. Um, the build grant and the bill grant and other existing funding sources will cover about 50% of the cost of the project. The city intends to create a special improvement, a special transportation impact fee and, a, and utility latecomers fees subject to approval of city council uh, to fund the remainder of the cost of the project. So that basically kind of sums up what they want to do with this. The whole idea is they want to create connectivity, England Boulevard, George Emler Drive, Mary Jane Boulevard, and Basically, they want to create a parallel, parallel lanes so they can have connectivity for George Elmer Drive, which is all the way near 44 Ranch Estates. They just want to connect it to uh, Mullen Road. And part of this, they're doing this through the build grant. So this is a federally funded deal. So as the money come in, comes in, they'll start adding more construction and streamlining it. So it's to basically kind of help with connectivity as developers are developing all these new homes in the Mullen area. Let's see. The better utilizing investment to leverage development, the build grant. So that's, uh, there's a lot of uh, grants that are sought after in a lot of communities to help uh, leverage, um, you know, more sidewalks, streets, transportation improvements, you know, stormwater, all sorts of like little things you don't really think about until later on in development. Uh, and a lot of times they always have, have the developer kind of put that in as well and the city's been trying to get that going along with that. But the build grant really helps that move forward in terms of the timeline for production. All right, a lot of information. Zoning, development, all that stuff. All great, interesting stuff happening within the city of Missoula. Um, let's see. Myrta Becerra, city council member, speaks on it. Motion, this is a very important piece of the puzzle for um, development in this area. The transportation and land use connection is imperative to have um, a, a well thought out uh, planning and development in this area. So. Um, I hope that you will support this motion. Thank you. So Housing Navigator, what is it? What does it do? Uh, with, the help, with the help of Partnership Health, which also provides medical care for those who uh, don't have access to basic medicine, 
plan to create a job that will help homeless folks in finding housing. So this works specifically with people who are tr having trouble finding homes and help them basically reintegrate integrate into housing. Uh, all this for $40,000. Um, here's Gwen Jones uh, from the city council member talking about this motion. This is something that I'm really glad to see come through council. Uh, we have a lot of housing issues in Missoula, um, but specifically we want to get as many homeless housed as possible, especially as we head into winter. So having this position filled, um, someone who will specifically help those people navigate the system through our coordinated entry system um, that will know exactly what resources are out there and how to connect them with them and get them housed as best as possible is a really good thing. So I'm happy to make this motion and support it. And so they were talking a little bit more about this process as well. This is one of the many things that the city talked about. Um, we're going to move on to the next topic. So I'm just trying to breeze through a lot of this because I have a whole Parks and Rec committee meeting that I'm going to be talking about. So uh, the larger chunk of this meeting was devoted to TEDs, otherwise known as townhouse exemption projects, uh, or townhouse exemption um, development in the Mullen area. Um, at this point, the city approves TEDs and uses them to streamline housing in Missoula. There's a huge demand for uh, housing in Missoula. Um, this is the Mullen area, and if you're interested in finding out, you can go to Missoula Mull. Uh, you can you can Google Missoula Mullen project. They have a whole website devoted to the Mullen area project, and you can kind of see what they're developing and what the plans are. And as the money comes in, what they're going to be doing for phasing project. I've talked about this a lot. I don't need to talk about it too much, but I just want to give you a little update on all that and more. You can find out more information about these particular projects and this uh, section of it by going to ci.missoula.mt.us. All right, so let's move on to a meeting I have added to the end of my city council report, and it is the Parks and Rec meeting. And this is kind of a big deal because what they're trying to do is they're trying to improve Karis Park and access to Karis Park from various sides. Best Reed Park, Kiwanis Park, they want to create a riverfront trail that kind of follows the Milwaukee Trail, but goes from all the way from Kiwanis, maybe actually even Missoula College. They want to, um, that's the plan is they want to do it from Missoula College all the way to the California Street Bridge, actually Russell from, Ru sorry, I'm just like, that's kind of like the big plan. So, uh, so actually I'm going to let the specialist uh, uh, for uh, the Parks and Trails design, um, Nathan McLeod, talk on the plan over one year in the making. So let's take a listen. So I want you all to close your eyes and pretend like you're walking down Ryman Street on a winter day. There's twinkling lights in the trees as you walk through this improved gateway. And you can hear music playing on an updated sound system as you enter the park. There's the sounds of children laughing as they skate around the ice ribbon. And you can see a fireplace where grandparents are gathered around the fire watching their grandchildren skate. Santa Claus is set up on the side and kids are waiting in line to sit on his lap and ask for presents. There's Vendors set up in the pavilion selling locally made Missoula wares for the holidays. And it's this whole atmosphere of this festive environment that just doesn't happen down there right now. Uh, from Russell all the way to Missoula College, they plan to add 25% more park between Kiwanis, Best Read, and of course, Karis Park. Uh, parking, on the other hand, will be altered. But the biggest thing that will be altered is that all the parking underneath the Higgins Bridge will be um, gone. It'll, they won't be used. A lot of the people who already have been displaced who have lease parking underneath the, um, the Hicken Street Bridge because of the um, ongoing construction. And a lot of times when there's... Con con ugh, sorry. Um, and a lot of times when, Missoula's, when there's a lot of construction happening in Missoula, they like to kind of double dip and figure out how other construction can happen um, to coincide with it to help improve the area as it's being developed for the new bridge and stuff like that. So a lot of the people who lost the parking under the bridge have been moved to the first interstate bank parking garage. And so that's kind of what's happening there. The biggest pu push is for connectivity and trails. And that's part of the R Missoula downtown master plan from um, 2000, um, 2017, I believe, when they uh, applied it and then they started implementing it in 2019. Karis Aquinas forces you to bike through an apartment complex on an area side street. It's kind of weird to kind of get around through that, but they want to basically build out a nice trail to, for people to basically stay on the river and also improve the overall site and basically light it up so, so people can see late at night. They can walk there and feel that they can see who's coming and going and all that stuff. And so that's one of the big things they want to do for the downtown master plan. They want people to be able to see it from... Uh, the hip strip and kind of see a nice uh, 
a new um, trail area for people to use. Linda McCarthy, one of the partners with Missoula Par Downtown Partnership, and for those who don't know, is the, uh, um, the one who spearheads the uh, Missoula River City Roost Festival, and this is what she had to say. Um, this has been a, a wonderful partnership project between the Downtown Missoula Partnership and Missoula Parks and Recreation. Uh, this plan has gotten to a lot of the goals that we really had um, when we started on this um, pathway specifically enhancing functions and programming, uh, celebrating the river, improving sustainability and environmental quality, and of course, increasing park space and relocating um, surface parking. Um, this is sort of a continuation really of the first original downtown master plan from 2009, and then now the update from 2019. And um, we've had, as, as Nathan suggested, a significant amount of public engagement in this plan and we recognize okay there is more information on the presentation and you, as you saw there was a map overview and there you, you can learn more information by going to the uh, parks and rec committee meeting that happened and you can find that out of course on ci.missoula.mt.us ci.missoula.mt.us i'm going to say it over and over again um and that's where you can get all your meetings upcoming meetings agendas and all that stuff um Moving on, um, there's another big thing that's happening, and I think this is very important if you are a parent in the city of Missoula looking for basic child care, um, but most importantly, cheap child care because it's very hard and you're trying to um, be able to go to work for all those hours to provide for the children as they're going to school. So uh, Base Camp um, Missoula is part of the kind of CARES Act COVID relief deal. Uh, Meg Whitaker, oh, uh, Meg Witcher programs with Parks and Rec dive into the child care programs for Missoula's new school schedule and the conflicts with parents' work schedules. And this is what she had to say. In order to keep families working um, with a reduced school schedule, the community was really tasked in large community organizations, the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, ourselves, um, have, who've long been out of school time providers in the after school and summer setting, have, uh, have been asked by our community to step up and provide out of school time programming while kids are on this hybrid schedule at, um, at school. And so right now, most kids are at school two days a week um, and they go from 8.30, this is for elementary school, 8.30 to two, uh, either on Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday, Friday meaning that they are parents are looking for childcare from two to six o'clock when they work every day after school, Mondays, all days, and for full day programming um, so they can work, make a living, pay their mortgage, and continue to be a uh, productive, keep this big, uh, big wheel turning um, during this time. And so from what you saw in that picture, uh, base camp has been funded by the CARES Act, COVID relief um, act to help with after school and full daycare programs for parents looking for cheaper options. Uh, two grants totaling $470,000 were approved recently through these programs to reduce fees. Um, originally for a drop off for the day is about $40, but with this you can negotiate and you can sign a form, form online and where you might not have to pay at all or you can pay anywhere between $1 to $20 per session. Uh, the Parks and Rec Department created a form for parents to fill out to be able to take advantage of this new deal. And here's Meg Witcher again talking about it. You know, we've got families who are in our upper middle class who are who are um, taxed out and uh, and stressed out. And so this self-reported income form allowed us to really have an accessible system for financial support um, in and directly matriculating folks into our Lowell and Franklin and Base Camp program. So far, Base Camp is being hosted at Franklin, Lowell, and the Old Library Building. Um, host these sessions. Good news for penny pinching parents. It seemed to work since the se se since September. The number of kids went up from 467 to 827, and they're hopefully going to help continue. Um, they also uh, want they also patted themselves on the back, um, mentioning that they had a record turnout in terms of numbers for a lot of their summer camps this last summer. So overall, what we learned um, in my report, uh, don't jump to conclusions. Uh, I stopped doing that years ago. Uh, many programs and city development depends on grants. So a lot of times, in terms of money, uh, they always have to readjust the fiscal year budget to reflect money that comes in from grants, federal grants, or otherwise. Um, so the, the, the budget has to constantly change. 
and also who knows if rates or fees start going up so the city would have to adjust and reallocate funds for you know the lighting district and stuff like that. I don't want to get too into the nitty gritty of it, but for a lot of times the budget for fiscal year 2021 is very um, fluid, and they usually base they usually base a lot of their funds on what they've paid the year before, and they determine like what they're going to be invested in going in forward this year as well. So. All right, so yeah, a lot of money coming in through CARES Act and the build grants, just a lot of money going that like that. But if you are interested in finding out what the city is doing, uh, what uh, uh, the county is doing as well, uh, you can go to ci.missoula.mt.us for all your information and all your city council needs. MCAT is Missoula's community media resource. NCAT offers equipment like camera rentals and training like instruction and distribution help like cable TV channels, starting your own YouTube channel, a short clip for Instagram or Facebook. NCAT helps people who want to make TV shows, social media clips, and podcasts. In our new home, in the Missoula Public Library, MCAT will be offering classes in camera use, getting the best sound and lighting quality, how to use a multi-camera studio with green screen and other special effects. In addition, we will be teaching video editing on popular platforms like iMovie, Final Cut Pro, and Adobe Premiere. For kiddos, we offer animation classes along with other multimedia activities for after school, during the weekend, and summer camps. MCAT has been serving the Missoula community for over 30 years with the material and the guidance to let your creative side blossom in audio-visual video. Be sure to visit us on the first floor of the new Missoula Public Library. Hello and welcome back. I uh, just wanted to kind of give you a touch base on what's going on with MCAT. MCAT is currently in the uh, new public library. Uh, we've had some issues with our um, our website. So if you go to MCAT.org and you're trying to watch any kind of videos on our video on demand page, we started a whole new system. So the whole look of our video on demand is going to overall change. And I heard back from one of my coworkers saying that they're working on it. It is a current process. I'll let you guys know. It's one of the reasons why I haven't shown you any like brand new programs. I'm usually the guy who posts like, oh, check out what's on new on MCAT tonight. I haven't been able to access a lot of those videos and even the schedule from online. So a lot of times we're, we're, uh, um, we're basically... Uh, thrown back into the newspaper for any programming that are happening on MCAT. So you'd have to look at the uh, cable listings or you know, your charter cable box because they will tell you what kind of shows are coming up on MCAT as well. Um, channel 189 and 190, I just want to give you guys a little update on that. Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I know that MCAT's going to be doing a lot of live streams. A big thing actually is happening is that they're not necessarily doing a parade of lights, but they are doing a uh, basically a tour of lights, if you catch my drift. Uh, so Campus Drive at the University of Montana, they're going to basically have all the things that are lit up like they would have the parade of lights, but people are asked to basically drive through. It's like a drive-through parade. So you will drive through the parade, you'll see all everything that's lit up, everything like that. Um, as MCAT, <clears throat> we're gonna, I'm gonna try to bring out the drone and give you a nice little uh, look on what it's gonna kind of look and feel like. Um, if it's a windy day, I might just end up just uh, basically putting a camera out and just putting it on a tripod and just kind of scanning around. But for the most part, I wanna make sure that you guys um, can still have an experience and still remember uh, the parade of lights, even though that it's not a official parade or a group gathering deal, but more of a drive-through. So that's kind of what's happening with the parade of lights. MCAT's doing a lot of live streams for the Zootown Arts Community Center for their social distancing sessions. Um, I would tell you about the one that happened Thursday night, which would be the uh, the comedy show Now What, which is about uh, a reaction to the most recent presidential election. Hey. I didn't mention the presidential election at all. I'm kind of proud of myself. <laughs> um, but uh, the big thing of, with that is that also on Saturday, um, we're going to be doing a ballet concert with Rocky Mountain uh, Ballet Academy. Um, 
God, I, I, I'm sorry if I butchered that, but the Rocky Mountain Ballet, School of Ballet, are doing a show on Saturday night, starting at 7.30, and they're doing a, a consecutive shows at the Zach for social distancing sessions every Saturday, 7.30, to when they end. So, uh, you guys can check out the live stream. Uh, we just did a live stream last Saturday with uh, two bands. Uh, the quality was kind of poor in terms of the live stream. I have rectified that since then, and we'll hopefully have a nice, smooth stream. But there is an updated uh, facelift that I gave it so that I have a higher def definition resolution for you guys to look at as well. So, that's kind of what's happening with MCAT. In terms of like going into the new library, um, with the new restrictions on the City County Health Department, uh, it's definitely looking to be a little bit a la later delay, but with the whole new vaccine and everything, it's looking very promising. Um, but everyone has to uh, show some patience and see whether or not uh, these vaccines are safe, and we'll see how things kind of go. So, I mean, January is a whole new world. Like, we, we, have a whole, we have a whole new political system in the state of Montana, a huge red wave here in the state of Montana. Um, we're going to see how that's going to affect uh, your day-to-day -day life as we go into the 2021 legislation session for uh, Montana. Uh, what else? I can't think of anything too uh, substantial to really talk about in terms of just news and just kind of talk and gossip. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop vamping here, and I'm going to thank you guys for joining me on my morning show. It was a little... It was a bit longer. Um, I had a, a full city council report for you guys. Uh, but for Wake Up Missoula and for MCAT, I'm Scott Ramp.